I'm Dr. Peter Kernahan from the Department of Surgery and the Program in the History of Medicine at the University of Minnesota. This module will provide a brief introduction to the history of surgical institutions from medieval Europe to the present day. Institutions play an important role in defining a profession. While sociologists have debated the definition of a profession at great length, generally accepted criteria include a distinct body of knowledge, control of entry, control of training, self-regulation, and an ethical code. Carrying out these functions requires an institutional structure. Within the medical profession as a whole, each specialty can be seen as a smaller professional grouping. Thus, the development of surgery as a distinct specialty is intimately connected to the development of surgical institutions. During the medieval and early modern periods in Europe, physicians and surgeons represented distinct occupations. Physicians were the gentlemen, classically educated at a university, and, like all gentlemen, they left manual labor to others. Physicians were few in number and for the upper classes. The great majority of the population had little or no contact with them. Surgeons trained by apprenticeship, although commonly referred to as barber surgeons, master surgeons represented a distinct group. In England, for example, they had only joined the barbers when Henry VIII forced a merger with the barber's company in 1540. As this painting illustrates, while the master surgeons cut for stone, treated complex wounds, and performed amputations, the barber surgeons let blood, lance boils, and cut hair. The growing professionalization of surgery in the 18th century led, in England, to the institutional separation of barbers and surgeons in 1740. The Company of Surgeons subsequently became the Royal College of Surgeons in 1800 and would provide the inspiration for the American College of Surgeons. Apothecaries, the final medieval and early modern occupational group, compounded and administered medicines. So far as is known, no fellow of the Royal College of Physicians ever emigrated to the British colonies in North America. As an aside, the institutional history of medicine is quite different in Spanish America. Further, many of the leading American physicians of the colonial period had trained in Edinburgh, where by the 18th century both physician and surgeon received a common initial education. American doctors by training and necessity were generalists. Moreover, this generalism was a source of pride and fit well with cultural ideals of Yankee ingenuity and rugged individualism. Surgery expanded rapidly in the latter part of the 19th century, driven by anesthesia, the germ theory, and new ideas about disease. Small specialty societies of like-minded elite physicians began to develop first locally and then nationally. This specialism represented a challenge to the medical profession, particularly in surgery. Any doctor could operate out of either necessity or ambition. Training was informal at best, and many physicians were poorly educated. After the abolition of professional licenses during the Jacksonian era, around 1828 to 1850, states only resumed licensing doctors from the 1870s onwards. To this day, so far as individual states are concerned, we are all physicians and surgeons. Finally, competition for patients among a large, fractious, poorly paid profession was intense. The title of a 1911 muckraking bestseller captures the times, Medical Chaos and Crime. Unsurprisingly, outcomes were often poor. Further, the, the high fees surgeons could charge as this magazine article illustrates, encouraged many to attempt a surgical career. Given the competition among would-be surgeons for cases, general practitioners could demand, or be offered, a share of the surgical fee for a referral, a practice known as fee-splitting, and one that encouraged unnecessary operations. The rapid expansion of surgery also meant a rapid expansion in the number of hospitals, often just converted houses, Many of these were poorly run and poorly equipped. A discussion question. Should this situation be addressed? And, if so, 
How? Could existing institutions or state intervention be the answer? Among existing institutions, the AMA placed a premium on unifying a historically divided profession. Trying to restrict the practice of surgery risked alienating many members. The small, elite national specialty societies, weighted towards the Northeast, had an academic focus and neither the interest nor the resources to reform surgery, no matter how strongly some individual members felt about the problem. A few states and provinces considered requiring licenses for surgeons, a move vigorously opposed by medical societies. Only Alberta adopted specialty licensing. The solution would come by creating a new institution, a college of surgeons. Although reform was supported by a number of leading surgeons and piously wished for by many more, it required the entrepreneurial talents and drive of Chicago gynecological surgeon Franklin Martin to make it a reality. He was, in the words of one contemporary, a born organizer. Martin founded Surgery, Gynecology and Obstetrics now the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. He organized the Clinical Congress of Surgeons as a national meeting providing what we would now call CME. The 1912 Clinical Congress would provide the starting point for the American College of Surgeons. Franklin Martin appointed Edward Martin, no relation, a leading Philadelphia surgeon and hospital reformer, as president of the Clinical Congress in 1912. Edward Martin then appointed two committees, one to organize a college of surgeons, headed by Franklin Martin, the other to reform hospitals, headed by medical reformer and Boston surgeon Ernest Codman. With the college incorporated, Edward Martin headed the committee tasked with determining the entrance requirements for the new college, a task which was expected to take six months, took almost two years of protracted debate. What the college finally accepted was a largely experiential or performance-based definition of the qualified surgeon. The case reports were the examination. For the first time, patients in North America had a definition of a specialist. While a spirited advocate of hospital reform, Cardman lacked Franklin Martin's political and organizing skills. The college took over the task of hospital standardization from Cardman's committee. Because the ACS had no legal authority, the program required hospital cooperation. The standardization program was one of uplift rather than punishment. If you want to know why operative reports use the format they do, this is why. It all started in 1919 and was the first national system of hospital inspection in the world. Focused on professional unity, the AMA regarded any organization that attempted to represent an important specialist constituency as a threat, a feeling exacerbated by personal animosity between Martin and the AMA. George Cryle, a regent of the college and founder of the Cleveland Clinic, referred to this as the Battle of Chicago, one which ended in an uneasy truce. The ACS continued to inspect and approve hospitals until 1950, when a new organization, the Joint Commission, representing the AMA, ACS, and the American Hospital Association, took over the task. One by one, specialty societies developed academic exams to certify specialists. Ophthalmology formed the first board in 1917, receiving administrative support from the college. Surgery didn't get a board until 1937, for reasons that we'll see in the next slide. The Advisory Board on Medical Specialties, now the American Board of Medical Specialties, became the umbrella organization for the various boards. Why was surgery relatively late in forming a board? By the 1920s and 30s, the Flexner reforms of medical education had produced a new cadre of full-time academic doctors. Everts Graham of Washington University of St. Louis was a leading figure among a younger generation of academic surgeons. Their development of the surgical residency will be covered in another module. Graham and his colleagues felt that the college's certification standards, unchanged since 1913, were inadequate. Feeling rebuffed by the college's old guard, they took their case for a surgical 
board exam to the American Surgical Association. After heated negotiations, the ACS acquiesced and agreed to cooperate in forming the American Board of Surgery as a separate entity. Ironically, ten years later, Graham, by then chair of the Board of Regents of the college, would try unsuccessfully to incorporate the ABS into the college. In the supervision of graduate education, the ASA, the ACS, and the AMA had all had overlapping programs in the 1930s and 40s. After considerable debate in 1950, the three organizations agreed to form a joint organization, the Residency Review Committee for Surgery to oversee surgical residencies. As a result, unlike the Royal Colleges in the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australasia, in the United States one institution does not have sole responsibility for the education and certification of surgical specialists. This pluralistic approach, which evolved in the 20th century, was America's response to specialization. Nonetheless, the American College of Surgeons remains the largest surgical organization and the only one that represents all surgical specialties. This module has provided a very short outline of the role of surgical institutions in defining surgery as a specialty. I hope that it has shown that institutions develop within a particular historical context. We inherit institutional structures that are shaped by both contingency and individual action. As you progress through your surgical careers, I hope that you will actively participate in and contribute to them.